Okay, guys. Um, <clears throat> so you might be wondering, right? So, so what is a, a financial services institution doing in a healthcare conference, right, or a health tech conference? <laughs> okay. So Allianz is one of the biggest global financial services companies in, in the world. Um, there are many, many divisions. So I belong to the insurance division. And in insurance, we have general insurance, and we also have uh, health insurance and life insurance. So um, I, I'm part of the innovation team that sits in Asia, in Singapore, and uh, we are responsible for building innovations in, uh, in healthcare and health, and health insurance. Um, I, I have two roles, right? So I have a data science role, so I create capabilities in uh, machine learning, data science, data mining uh, for insurance. And my the other role is innovation, so I'm responsible for generating um, innovation activities for Allianz in Asia. That means partnerships with startups, um, partnerships with universities, um, and, and all sorts of players right, in the ecosystem. Um, interestingly, we, we had this long, pretty long-term partnership with MIT, and we we're pr quite proud to say that we, we had a paper published in Nature just two weeks ago, and it's on the cover of Nature on smart cities and the future of mobility. So, so maybe you guys don't know that Allianz is involved in partnerships and collaborations at, on NXDEMIA, but we are. Um, so, but, but that's coming up from Singapore. All right. Um, so today's talk is really about mental health. Uh, I'm, I'm trained as a computational biologist. I have friends and collaborations across the, the medical fields, right, in universities, um, with, with uh, startups. Um, <clears throat> so one of the interesting work that we are doing here is looking at uh, schizophrenia. Right? So if you look at the picture over here, this is actually taken from the movie A Beautiful Mind. Um, it was, it was um, in 2003, there was this movie. Uh, if you guys were old enough to watch the movie or you're young enough to watch the movie, <laughs> It's really about uh, John Nash, right, who suffered from schizophrenia right, throughout his, uh, pretty much his adult life. Um, and it's his wife, right, his long-suffering wife. And some people used to say that um, in schizophrenia, it's not so much the patient who's suffering, but really the caregivers. Um, okay, so a little bit more about the background of schizophrenia. We find that this is one of the most debilitating diseases globally. Right? In the US, uh, it costs the U.S. healthcare system as much as $60 billion a year. If you look at some stats, right, we know that it's one of the um, patients with schizophrenia has one of the longest hospital stay, right, and it has the highest total cost uh, of hospital stay um, um, among all the mental illnesses. And it turns out that uh, the main driver of cause is actually disease relapse. Right, so it's not so much of the patient suffering from the disease and being admitted to the hospital, but it's more when they get admitted to the hospital, they get treated, they go back home, and later on they get relapses along the way. Those relapses are the major drivers of cost. So what you're trying to do here is not just to um, understand why people become schizophrenic, but also uh, to looking at management of the disease. Now this is um, some, some, some numbers on relapse, right? It's, it's huge, right? The relapse numbers can be very, very big, and, and this is a serious problem. Um, now, this is, a, this is a chart showing the kind of uh, uh, the cost coming from um, uh, in direct hospital costs as well as indirect hospital costs, uh, indirect costs, right? So most of the costs are actually indirect. So meaning to say that people with schizophrenia, um, they lose productivity, uh, they can't work, and so this is a huge drain to the economy, right? Everywhere in the world, right? A couple of interesting research in data mining, data science, machine learning space around schizophrenia research. Um, it ranges all the way from looking at uh, image data um, to genetics, right? So, so it's a very, very active area of research. So there is a consortium uh, looking at all these different types of um, data and, and building uh, models for it. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to do today is really to share with you some work around structural MRI data and machine learning for schizophrenia. Now, if you look at the, the, the picture over here, there are two brains, right, um, generated from MRI scans. Now, the brain on the left um, it's, it belongs to someone with schizophrenia, right? So if you look at, look at some part of the, the, in the center part, there is this imbalance, right, in the red, the red spots that are a little bit imbalanced, um, whereas the MRI scan on the, the, the right, right, it's a little bit more balanced. So, so through the scans, we know that uh, there are differences uh, in the brains of people with schizophrenia versus people who are normal, right? And, and this is the same for a lot of mental illnesses, if you read the research papers, um, ranges from bipolar, schizophrenia, depression. Um, 
So, so many, many mental illnesses have very different structural MRI images uh, between controls and people who have the disease. So if you, if you build very simple supervised machine learning models just using the MRI data, uh, we can very, very easily classify uh, the two groups, right? Normal versus uh, disease. We have as much as 85% accuracy, a very high uh, ROC curve, right? a very good ROC score. Um, now, but this is not really the critical part, right? The critical part is really to help people who have the disease and trying to detect the disease early and have early intervention. So if you look at this chart over here, I, I took it from Google, <laughs> and it's quite true. If you look at how people recover from mental health over time, um, it, it's, it's very different from a normal disease, right? In a normal disease, for example, if you're suffering from uh, diabetes, right? If you take medications properly, you live a uh, healthy life, you exercise, um, your health improves linearly, right? But in mental health, it's highly volatile. It's almost like a stock price, right? It goes up very fast, it comes down very fast, right? So it's, it's highly volatile. And you look at the troughs right, in, the, in the graph, um, we, we tend to look at it as a relapse episode. Right? So what we're going to do here is to see if we can um, analyze MRI, MRI data and predict relapse early. Okay? So that's a hypothesis. Right? So uh, we can define relapse as um, someone who is um, hospitalized, right? or there are certain um, expression of uh, symptoms, right? of florid uh, psychotic symptoms. Um, using certain scales. Right? So if one of these two criteria appear, then we treat that person as having a relapse. All right, so this is a little bit technical, but uh, if you guys are trained in machine learning, you should be able to understand this, this uh, framework. So what we have is some data coming from the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore. Uh, we have approximately about 90 91 patients and sort of like 90 controls. It's not a very big set of data, but it, 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 it's a pretty rich set of data because we do have the structural MRI data, and we also have a little bit of uh, the clinical variables, right? So we have things like medication data, uh, what was prescribed to the patient, the dosage. Um, so we have a little bit of a longitudinal data around therapeutics, right? Medications and the procedures that they, they've gone through, you know, throughout the hospital stay. Um, also, we have patient outcomes, which is important, right? Um, so we took all this data, and we put it into um, some data preparation and feature selection process. Uh, we tried different methods to select the features. Um, after that, we do a proper machine learning uh, training, right? again using different algos. Right? We have certain groups doing uh, deep learning, we have certain groups doing uh, simple things like uh, random forest, and then we get the ROC curve and we, we, you know, we got the results. Right? So, so this is um, a very simple model with minimal feature selection. Uh, we get about 71% accuracy and ROC about 0.71. Um, so some of the features here um, are ranked, right? So these are some of the key, uh, what we call MRI features that strongly indicate if someone uh, is likely to be, uh, to have relapsed or not, right? Um, it's a bit technical, but uh, we do, that. we notice that some of these features correlate very well with existing research. Um, now, if we do a little bit more around this uh, feature selection, if we use, uh, for example, SVM recursive feature elimination, which works very, very well for high dimensional data sets, uh, we find that accuracy improves by a lot. Now, th this is an interesting problem because we do have a lot, a lot of uh, MRI structural features, right? We have um, close to thousands of it, right? So if we don't have a proper feature selection process, we're not gonna get good accuracy. Um, it's, a, it's a highly imbalanced data set, right? You have not that many um, uh, controls, healthy controls and disease samples, but you have so many features, right? So it's a highly imbalanced data set, so we have to do some kind of feature selection. Um, so the, what, what worked was actually the SVM recursive feature elimination. This is actually not a very new approach. It was, um, it was discovered a long time back in 2000. Uh, those of you who are old enough, it was uh, created or developed by researcher in genetics, right, on gene expression. Uh, I still remember because back then I was doing my PhD, so so it was, uh, it was very close to my heart, right? so it, works, it still works very well nowadays. Um, so we, we can quite dramatically improve the accuracy and also the ROC scores. Um, uh, so so, so the, the regions are a little bit different, so, <clears throat> but it's not updated here. So we, we, do, some, we do see changes in the uh, most important regions and as well as improvement in accuracy. 
All right, so this is all for the MRI, the structural MRI features, just look at MRI features. In fact, we have not incorporated clinical features into the models. There are a couple of reasons why. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you know, once you put in the clinical features, you're going to dramatically improve the score. But it turns out that when we study the features, the clinical features, uh, we, we think that maybe it's not high quality enough. <laughs> because sometimes, uh, you know, when you, know, when, when you take, draw data from um, uh, electronic medical records, some data points are not captured well, <laughs> okay? Because sometimes it's, it's manually imputed by the nurses. Uh, sometimes they make mistakes, and it's quite clear from the data that sometimes they have duplicates. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. When we did some other projects where we analyzed electronic medical records, it turns out that just a lot, a lot of this data from the EMRs may not be so robust. Uh, for example, when we did a project on uh, uh, in cancer biology, when we were trying to understand uh, can we predict relapse on in cancer patients, um, we find that the physician who is noting down the diagnosis of the cancer patients sometimes didn't label it properly. So when someone is at stage four, <laughs> the, the cancer doctor will just like put stage two or something. Maybe it's a mistake or maybe he's in a hurry. <laughs> so drawing data from EMR sometimes will give you not so good results. Not so much because your models are not working, but maybe because the base data is, is not high quality. And it's hard for a data scientist to find out what's wrong. Right? Sometimes they just get all the data and they just, just do the models. They don't question whether if the data was captured properly or not. So it turns out that in this case, uh, there are qual uh, quality control issues in the data, in the clinical data. So that's why we didn't want to put it in. Now, this is a slide on uh, understanding the genetics behind schizophrenia. So there are multiple published papers and groups around the world working on understanding the relationship between genetic mutations and schizophrenia. Uh, we do know, if, this is what I call a Manhattan plot, and the, um, what's on the bottom is actually the chromosomal positions. So at certain regions of the chromosomes, um, we see highly significant uh, correlations with uh, schizophrenia risk. So this is another big data problem that we are looking at. We are looking at about 30,000 genes. Um, and then we are looking at as much as like two to three million uh, mutation points, right? Now, if we have such a small data set and we are looking at so many variations, so it's, it's, it's really a very complex and high dimensional data set to work with. Uh, but nevertheless, we are trying to incorporate some of these data in. Right. So one of the overarching objectives here is to look at multiple sources of data and putting it together so that the intersection of this data, when you apply some machine learning, it's going to work better. So we have looked at uh, structural features using MRI. Uh, we're potentially going to look at genetics. Now the third piece is behavior. Right. So what we're going to do in the future is to create an app um, that we can roll out to both controls and healthy patients and capture behavioral data, right? So the, the text messages, uh, where they go, uh, the things that they capture, and even the, the, even, even the images captured from a selfie, from, from selfies uh, could, could tell a lot about a patient's uh, tendency or predisposition to disease. In schizophrenia, there are two forms of symptoms. One is the positive symptoms and the negative symptoms. The positive, positive symptoms are related to hallucinations and delusions. Now, the negative symptoms are a little bit harder to detect. It would be things like withdrawal from society, um, people acting very reserved. And actually, if you look at the faces of people with chronic schizophrenia, they have a very, very blunted face. You know? So basically, they have no emotions. And imagine you can capture this data using the selfie, using the handphone. Uh, you can tell a lot about what this patient is going through. So this, this whole holistic approach of looking at multiple data points, uh, it's, 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 I hope that it's going to give us better results in the long run. Um, and that, I think that's it. So happy to take your questions.